Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your greatness. I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your forgiveness. Thank you for the time of communion that we've had, the reset that we all get each week from remembering the sacrifice of your son that washes away our deepest iniquity, our worst sins, washes it away in a sea of grace. Thank, thank you for that. So I pray this morning that you would um, that you'd be with this message, that it would hit at the heart of who needs, who needs to hear it, and that you would separate us, that we might come out from among them, live lives that are pure and holy and pleasing to you, that others might be changed, not because of us, but because of your greatness. May they see that in us. We pray this in the name of your Son, our great Savior, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in this series, this ordinary series, and Jenny has already ruined this, uh, this message already, and here's why. Because I was going to say, if you look at Jenny's ears this morning, you will notice something. Um, not that you go around looking at my wife's ears, but if you did, I, did, I made a purchase over Christmas, and like the, she's got like three earrings like that goes down the ear. I'm a big fan of the multiple earrings. Anyway, the bottom one, um, I bought her new earrings, like diamond earrings for Christmas. And um, I was going to say, if you look at them, you'll be impressed with me and the job that I did picking it out. Eh, she's not wearing them. So um, yeah, pfft, on that, um, I do like the ones that you're wearing. It's just not the ones that I bought you. But here's the thing. If you've ever bought a diamond before, you are aware they ain't cheap. Um, these little tiny inanimate objects, these rocks, they're sparkly, but they are not cheap objects. But you know what is? I don't know if you've ever thought of this. The diamond itself is not cheap. But the people that go into the diamond mines and mine all day long, finding these inanimate objects that sparkle, do you know how cheap those people's lives are in our eyes? Like, I don't know if you've ever seen this, and I know you can't see it from where you are, even on the big screen, but these are the areas where America gets its diamonds. Angola, Central African Republics, Congo, Guinea, Liberia. The major one is Sierra Leone. Do you know what happens to the people in Sierra Leone? The people, and I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you're wearing diamonds, by the way. I know that you didn't ask for this to happen. You're just buying the diamond. Children, mostly boys ages 5 to 17, are forced to mine for diamonds in Sierra Leone. Uh, some children are trafficked from rural areas to work in diamond mines. They're sent by their families. These children often uh, are, are recruited under deceptive terms. They're forced to work without pay in hazardous conditions underground in the mines excessively for long hours, many of whom are not provided any food. It is amazing to me that diamonds are more valuable to us than the lives of the diamond miners. And it's not just that. It's the same reason why banks are more secure than schools. And I'm not making a political statement here. I'm just making a statement of reality. You want to knock off a bank and invade a bank? you got to come up with a plan. You don't have to have that much of a plan to invade a school building. You just don't. There's something that's being said there about what we prioritize as humans. It's why human beings have never solved and we will never solve the problem of sweatshops and slavery. We've never solved the problem of slums and we never will. Because the reality is that the lives of little people are not that important to us. And I think that's probably why many of us struggle living in Greentown, Indiana from time to time, recognizing we are little people. When it starts to dawn on you, what, what, what does my life matter to the people that matter? All of a sudden we start feeling that insignificance. Maybe not to the degree of a diamond miner who thinks nobody in the world cares about them. But we all have that feeling because we're little people and I need to stress to you, and this is what the whole point of this series is, that God's value system is not ours. Our value system has been jacked up by sin, totally messed up. It's why we comfortably buy diamonds without giving a second thought to the people that went through agony to try to find these rocks in, 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 in caves. It's why we're able to go about our lives and buy products that come from China, that come from all of these places, without getting, giving a second thought. Because those lives and our value system have become far less valuable to us than the things that those lives give us. 
The sweatshops, the people in the sweatshops, the people in the slums, what we get from them is more valuable to us and it allows us to kind of forget about what's happening to them. God's value system is not like ours. And God does not want us to have the value system or to view ourselves through the value system that the world operates from. Let me prove that to you. If you got your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 9. This is Jesus, and he's, he's working amongst the crowds. He's teaching amongst the crowds. I want you to look at what he says in chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. Kind of throwaway verses that we oftentimes overlook. I don't want us to overlook these verses any longer. Verses, uh, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, understand who these crowds are. These are the diamond miners. These are people who are not movers and shakers. They don't have work to do. They don't have businesses. They're not merchants. They don't have big homes. These are people that are destitute, who are looking for something in life, and they're following Jesus everywhere. And Jesus sees these poor, pathetic people. And what does it say? He had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Why are the workers few? Because everyone in the world is too busy chasing after things. They're chasing after reputations. They're chasing after work. They're chasing after a, a name for themselves. And all the while you have all of these pathetic in the eyes of the world people. The harvest is right there. But there are so few people that care about the little people. But I do. That's what Jesus is saying. I do care about those little people. The testimony of all of Scripture tells us that it's not gold and it's not diamonds that God puts particular value upon. You know what he puts particular value upon? He puts it on us. He puts it on human beings. He puts it on the little people. He puts it on the children that are being forced daily into the back of diamond mines in Sierra Leone. That's who God values. Skip a few paragraphs down into Matthew chapter 10. You'll see the exact same thing. Matthew chapter 10. Look ahead to verse 29. Same teaching, essentially. He says, this is Jesus, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? They're worthless in the eyes of the world. They're sold for a penny. And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. God knows when a sparrow that isn't worth two pennies falls to the ground. And even the very, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God notices when a sparrow falls. And you are worth more than many sparrows. You know who he's saying this to? He's saying it to the kids in the back of the diamond mines. That's who he's saying it to. People that have never heard this before. The God of eternity is saying, you matter to me. And I'm going to suggest to you that if, if, if they matter to him, they should matter to us. Those lives should matter to us. That's how we should view this. And the question is, why do they matter? Well, here's the wild thing. Carl Sagan, you remember two weeks ago, I played that pale blue dot thing of his where he said, we're all just dust. That's all we are. We're cosmic space dust. Sagan was right. That's exactly what we are. Well, he's half right. Because Sagan said, since we're dust and we're meaningless in the universe, we just got to find a project to do to try to make ourselves feel better. And that's the ultimate point of life. He's wrong about that. But he's right about us being dust. Remember, he calls us specks of dust suspended on a sunbeam. Now, check this out. Wild. I'm going to take you back into the book of Genesis. And we always read the beginning parts of Genesis as history. So we understand where the world came from and how it was made and how sin entered the world. And it's all academic. Don't make it academic. Recognize what we're being taught here. In Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God formed a man from what? From the dust of the ground. We are dust. That is what, uh, that's what we are. Sagan is exactly right. But then something happened. He takes the dust of the ground and God, almighty God, breathes into his nostrils, into this dust, the breath of life. And the man became a living being, animated by the heart of of God himself, the dust of the ground became a living, breathing reflection of God. The master artist, if you want to call him that. The master artist put so much of himself. Oh, I just spilled everywhere. That was not a good end to that drink. Sorry, and I was really building up to that point too, and then I just ruined it. Anyway, the, and I've made a mess. The master artist made such... He, this is such a masterpiece of his. He puts so much of himself into his masterpiece, which is us, 
that he could see a reflection of his own heart in us. I want you to stop right now. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you think about your life. I don't know exactly what you see as your value. I don't know if you're in the right place with that or if you're feeling insignificant. I don't know. But pause and ignore for just a second the world's value system. Ignore everything that the world tells you is where you should find your value and how happy your family is and the choices that you've made and and the, and the career that you have and the money that you have in your bank account. Ignore all of that for just a second and tell me that you're not seeing something right here. You feel unworthy and insignificant as a human being. Stop and look at that right there. The God of the universe put so much of himself into you, he sees a reflection of his heart in you. That's why you have meaning. That's why you have purpose. And it has nothing to do with anything you accomplish here on earth. It has nothing to do with any name that you've made for yourself. It has nothing to do with how well people think of you and all of that. Your value has everything to do with the fact that God created you as a masterpiece and he put his heart into you. And you know that that's true for you and it's also true for that little boy who right now is in the back of that diamond mine. It's the heart of God that's reflected in him. That's why our lives have value. These specks of dust were so loved by God. I'm talking about Adam and Eve. He, he, he takes this dust and he animates it. And they are so loved by God that he gives them responsibility to rule over everything else that he made. All of these amazing things in the universe. And he takes the dust and he breathes himself into it and says, now you get to rule all of this. And I'm going to tell you, it led to some pretty cool stuff. And this is where I think sometimes we read these opening accounts in Genesis and we miss it. We miss what's being revealed to us here. Forget the history for a second. Forget the academic side of it. And look at the relationship that God had with man. Don't miss what's going on here. I don't know. Have you ever had a kid and you've let him name a pet? Okay, we had a fish named Hashtag. I don't even know what that means, but it cracked me up every time. How's Hashtag doing? Well, he's belly up, actually. We got a flush Hashtag. And then we had, Addy named another one, Dr. Jackie Ogden. That was the name of our fish. And so people, we would be talking about, well, how's Jackie Ogden doing? Well, Dr. Jackie Ogden doesn't look too good today. She's swimming around in her own poop. I mean, that is, we would have these stupid names that the kids kids gave them. But we loved it. We laughed at it. I don't know if you've ever seen this um, viral video. It's one of my favorite ones that's gone around. Good Morning America played it. I think this is a British kid who had a moth in his room. Have you seen the moth kid? The moth that was flying around his room, and most kids are freaked out by that stuff. This kid loved the moth, and he wanted to keep it as a pet. And so they kept it in the room, and he named it. And his mom records this video of him say, just play the video. This is just too good. Watch this. Mills, what have you named your pet moth? <laughs> what have you named your pet moth? <laughs> Come on. Uh, 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 moth you. <laughs> moth you. <laughs> oh, no. Moth you. Great. I just love that, that little kid, he thinks it's so awesome. Now I want you to look at what happens. There's a point I want to make with all of this. Go back to Genesis 2. Forget the history, look at the relationship. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. What are you going to name this little flying creature in your room? Matthew. Okay, what are you going to name him? And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. I'm telling you, this is the relationship side that we overlook. I know that God had a moment like that mom with Adam. He said, what are you going to name this thing? Let's go with duck-billed platypus. And you don't think God just throws his head back and laughs because God is dwelling with man. He's walking with man. He's finding joy in his relationship with man, just like that mom did with her son. She can't get enough of it. She's cracking up even more than he is as he throws his little head back onto the bed. And you know God's doing the same thing. Watch the tree trunk, Adam. Settle down and, and say this like is it supposed to be. What does that tell us? Ignore the history and look at the relationship. God is our father. 
He loves us like a father. And he loves seeing us take ownership of his gifts. Just like we love seeing our own children take ownership. He loves seeing you enjoy the chocolate that he created. Hey, praise God when you're eating the chocolate. This is amazing. Thank you, God, for the chocolate. The strawberries. I don't know what it is that you're into. The sauerkraut. I don't care. Whatever it is, it's a gift from him. And you should be comfortable enjoying that and telling him and praising him for it. That's what you would want from your children when you give them good gifts. And he's given us so many good gifts. He loves seeing us enjoy one another. You're sitting with a friend, a spouse that is your best friend. And you enjoy each other's company. Are you thanking God for the gift that he gave you right there? The gift of relationships. That's our father. And God walked with them. And he talked with them. And he joked with them. Just like I walk with my own son. And you know what that means? That means that God is answering their many questions. Just like I answer my son's many questions that don't make any sense. And I think, what in the world is going on in this kid's head? And you know God's thinking the same thing. He made himself available. He made himself accessible to them. To us. To human beings, why does life matter? Why does your life have significance? It has nothing to do with what you accomplish and how much you impress other people. It has to do with the fact that you are loved by that laughing mom, by that father who adores you and who created you. The Genesis account is preserved for us as far more than just history. It's showing us our significance to God. In this universe of so many things going on, where is his focus? He's not busy out there spinning planets. He's not busy out there making comets fly around and, oh, watch this mathematical equation. No, he's spending his time laughing as Adam names the duck-billed platypus. That's where God's focus is. It's where, he, it's, where, it's where it's always been. And it's where ours should be as well. You don't have money. You don't have a big house. You don't have a great job or a great name. Look, I need you to understand these two, Adam and Eve, didn't find their value in any of that stuff. They didn't have any of that stuff. What did they have? They had a relationship with their father. They found value in their connection to, their connection with God. And we are intended to as well. If you are feeling insignificant, it is because you are using the world's value system to try to find significance. You will not find it there. You will only find it when you connect to your father who gives you that significance. Ask him anything. The most mundane thing, he's your father. The most confusing, the most hurtful thing that you've ever dealt with, talk to him about it. The most exciting or frustrating thing, um, Marion High School, uh, girls basketball, they have a new coach. Uh, Marion High School used to be a juggernaut in girls basketball, and they are in the midst of what we would call a rebuilding period right now. Um, they're not good. And they came over and played Eastern, and I announce as many of the girls' games as I can. And so I'm doing this game, and Marion's terrible, um, but this coach, God love him. He, he loves those kids, and you can tell he loves the Lord. He talked to God through that entire game. And I'm, I'm not, like everything about it, he was talking to the Lord. And it's not one of those things where he's using the Lord's name in vain. He, you can tell he literally has a relationship as though God is his assistant coach. And he's standing there saying, what in the world are we doing? Okay, there's this one point. Uh, Jenna Odell is number 24 for us. She's a senior. She's one of our better players. She's having a great game against Marion, okay? And so she scores every time she gets the ball. And so we're taking the ball out underneath the basket, and this coach is shouting at Charisma. That's one of his players. Charisma, don't let 24 get the ball. Whatever you do, stop 24 from getting the ball. Don't let her touch the ball. Charisma, get closer to her. You're not close enough to 24. Charisma, get on 24. Don't let her get the ball. So Maggie Johnson takes the ball out of bounds. Jenna pops out. She throws the ball right to number 24. And Jenna's got the ball, and she gets ready to shoot. Charisma then clicks. Oh, I'm not supposed to let her have the ball. And this little freshman girl just tackles Jenna right there on the court. <laughs> just tackles her, goes after her. This coach, like, I'm, st I'm behind, and he's standing over here to the left, and he just does one of these. He spins around like this. And he's looking right at me, except at the ground. And you know what he said? I loved this. I cracked up. I lost. I couldn't even announce the foul because I was dying laughing. He says, oh, Lord, thank you for that dumb child's passion. Help her, Lord. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm talking about through the whole game. It was, he didn't know what to say, so just thank you, God, for her passion. But, man, she's dumb. She is dumb. What is that? 
helper, Lord, through the whole game, and that's it. That's the kind of relationship that we're being told we can have with the Father. Thank Him for the smell of coffee that you enjoy. Or how about this? Ask Him to help you through a personal struggle. He's your Father. He loves you. You're not going to be able to get through your personal storms of life by concentrating on a project, by pouring yourself into your work, because that's not where significance is found. You'll never find it there. It's in your relationship with him. When it came to God, Adam and Eve's relation, their, their problem wasn't their size or their significance. That was never the issue. They had a perfect relationship with the Father. Their problem was that a fallen angel who had already rebelled against God tempted Eve to do the exact same thing. And he says to her, God's holding you back. He's keeping you from the knowledge of good and evil. And you want that knowledge. You need that knowledge because having that knowledge would make you like God. Wait a second. Like God, they're already like God. They already have his image. They already could reflect his goodness. They could reflect his love and his creativity. They had that, but they wanted to be like God in a different way. They wanted to be like God in a completely self-sufficient way. They wanted to be God. That's what they wanted, and that's what we want. That's what mankind wants. When we depart from our relationship with the Father to find significance elsewhere, what we are saying is we can be like God. We can manufacture, self-manufacture our own significance. And we've been following that path ever since. He gave us a world to rule, but instead we wanted, and I would say many of us still want, his throne. We want to sit on the throne. Uh, two weeks ago we talked about dreaming big. That's the definition of dreaming big. That's it. You dream so big, you want to be the God of your own personal universe. And notice where that dream is focused. Is it focused on glorifying God? No, it's focused on glorifying yourself. That's the issue. That's the problem of mankind. Scripture warns us over and over against that approach. Look at what the prophet Isaiah said. Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as what? Dust on the scales. You know how much dust tips the scales? It doesn't tip it at all. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. So think about this. We are specks of dust, and yet we are shaking our microscopic fists at our creator. And what are we saying to him? With our choices, with our decisions to rebel against him and his will for our lives, we shout at him, make room for my personal ambition. That's what you need to do, God. Get out of my way because I've got a dream. He lifted us from the dust of the earth, the dust of insignificance. He breathes into us and what do we do with his gifts? We use those gifts to separate ourselves from him. You know how frustrating that has to be for the father? <laughs> And yet, how does he answer it back? With love. It's, it's just unimaginable what he does. I need you to make sure you understand this. Many of you who are using the gifts that God has given you to separate from him, to try to forge your own path and be your own significance and be your own God, you were never intended. We were never intended and we were not made to have life apart from God. You cannot have life apart from God. He is the source of all life, and yet we try so hard to forge our own path and to, and to make our own lives. We feed our ambition by taking his gifts and using them for our glory and by isolating ourselves from him, the source of our significance. That's what's amazing. He has given us significance. He gives us good gifts. We take those gifts and we separate ourselves from him, which is the source of our significance, and then we spend a whole life trying to attain what? Significance. How stupid is that? How deceived is that? But that's what we do, and we become unknowingly that guy right there. That's what we're doing. We're sitting on the branch that God has made, connected to him, and we're using his gift to saw us apart from God. And then we wonder, why does my life feel empty? Why do I feel like I'm not accomplishing anything? Why do I feel like I'm not doing anything? Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 15. Listen to what he says, and, and see this in a new light. John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Right? I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. If you remain in me, you will have significance. You will have purpose. You will have meaning. As long as we stay connected, that's what, that's what you're going to have. You're going to bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you saw that branch off, you're not going to have life. 
You're not going to have meaning. You're not going to have purpose. You're going to have frustration. You're going to have bitterness. You're going to have sin. That's what your life is going to become. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Stay connected. If you are feeling insignificant in this life, I would contend that that's why. Because you are not remaining with the source of life. You're not connected to the source of life. Good luck. Good luck spending the next 60, 20, 10, 5, however many years you got left trying desperately to find life when you have cut yourself off from the source of it. You won't have it. Genesis chapter 2. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. You don't have to. I'll read it to you. Genesis chapter 2. We always read this as a curse. I don't want you to read this as a curse. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. You eat of this, you will surely die. That's a curse, sure, but it's also just a statement of fact. Where is the source of life? God, if you eat of the fruit, you're rebelling against God. You are sawing the branch and cutting yourself off. What is going to happen when you saw yourself off from the source of life? If we draw life from God, if that's the source of our life and our significance, and we cut it off, we're not going to know life at all. Where else are you going to get it? Where are you going to manufacture it? Uh, cut a rose. You ever gotten a rose before? A rose bush? You cut that thing and you put it in a vase. What have you done? You've killed the rose. The rose is dead. Now, sometimes people look at this passage and they eat the fruit and they don't instantly drop dead. Ah, oh, see, God wasn't telling the truth. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. When you cut the rose off from the branch, it is dead. It may still have a bloom for a little while, but it's, it's a dead rose. And it's not going anywhere. It doesn't wilt right away, but it's dead. It has no chance of ever growing. It has no chance of ever reaching its potential because it has been cut off from the source of life. You follow me, right? You're getting that? Yes? That's the story of humanity. That's what we've done. That's why there are so many people struggling so badly in this world trying to find meaning and purpose and looking for it in all the wrong places because we have cut ourselves off from the rose bush and then we're desperately trying to find a way to pour enough nutrients into the water to, to uh, have a counterfeit life. And it doesn't work. We're always searching. We're always trying. We're always desperately dreaming up the next great things. And yet here we are withering away. That's humanity. I'm telling you, you can try to find life and romance and family and pleasure. This is what people do. This is what they dedicate their lives to. Creative expression. Uh, I'm going to be myself, the real me. Accomplishment, friendship, travel. People pour their lives into those things, and that's what's going to give it meaning. How much of that lasts? None of it. It all fades away. You get old, and you can't do some of those things anymore. You lose interest. And none of those things bring you, you know what this is? You can try to build a life and make yourself have significance from any of that stuff. But in the end, that is all you are. You are a withering rose cut off from the source of life. That's what our lives become. We have been trying for thousands and thousands of years to try to find life apart from God. And we have failed and we are still failing miserably at it. Why? Because we're so tiny. And we're so insignificant apart from the Father. And we're dying. The best analogy I can give you, uh, you know, uh, Jenny and I, we just moved well, our family. We didn't leave the kids behind. We thought about it. Uh, but we did take the kids. But we moved. And when we were moving, um, in one of our front rooms was this plastic cabinet. One of those that you buy on Amazon that you don't want to move because it'll all just crumble. And in that uh, plastic cabinet... For the last 10 years, every financial document that has been mailed to me from First Farmers Bank and Trust, from all of the investment accounts and everything, I don't know, do I need to keep this? I don't know, it says important, so I probably should, and I just stuck it into that drawer. And in 10 years, how many times has anyone from the government come and say, we need to see that document that First Farmers, it never happened. So I have this drawer full of useless financial documents, but I don't just want to throw them in the trash, because I know many of you people just go around looking in people's trash to try to rip them off, and so I'm not going to do that. We have a shredder at home. 
I would still be shredding if I tried to shred all of those documents through that thing. So I did what you're supposed to do. You wait till your parents leave, uh, even when you're 40 years old. You wait till your parents leave, and then you go out to their house in the country where they've got a big concrete slab. You go late at night, and you take four trash bags full of these documents, and you douse them in lighter fluid, and you have a bonfire. And that's what I did. Mom and Dad were gone, and I went out there. I was probably out there two or three hours, and I had the little rake and everything, and I dumped like three containers of light, lighter fluid fluid on that stuff just all over every document was drenched in lighter fluid and then I stood back and like that it was like a movie I even turned around and walked away so <laughs> in the background had the camera set up so anyway Jenny was very impressed but anyway so I'm burning all of these documents right there now you know what happens it's late at night right and so the fire starts burning and some of those little pieces of paper this is the best analogy I can come up with some of those little pieces of paper from the documents would flicker up into the sky and some of them were bigger, and they'd be like a flame, and it would go shooting through the sky towards my parents' house. And I would say, please, God, don't let me burn my parents' house to the ground. I, mean, I think they've always anticipated it, but they probably thought that window had closed. Now, nah. anyway, so I would see it streaking across the sky, and then others of them would just drop right away. They're little tiny ones, and they would fall to the ground. And they would all wither away into ash. That's the point. That's the perfect analogy of so many people were separated from God. And some of us will streak really high. And for a moment, everybody will notice us. Others of you, others of us, we just fall to the ground and nobody even knows that we were here. But can I tell you, both of them end up in the same place. Both of them never amount to anything. Both of those things, whether it streaks really high or it just falls to the ground, in a matter of seconds they meet the same fate. We, we, we flicker for a moment with the glory that God has put in us, that source, that burning fire, and we separate ourselves, and for a moment we hold on to it. And then what becomes of humanity separated from God? What happens is we slowly fade to ash and to dust, never to be seen or heard from again. It's what God is meaning in Genesis chapter 3 when he says, By the sweat of your brow you'll eat your food until the re you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are... And to dust you will return. You will turn back into dust. The barrier between us and God was never about our size. It has always been about our choices. We had significance. We had meaning despite our size. We had intimacy with the Father. We had paradise, but we cast it aside to try to rob more from the one who had given us everything. And this is what I was getting at earlier. What an amazing God we serve. That in spite of that... In spite of seeing our rebellion, our flat-out hatred towards him, he met our rebellion and our sin with a gift even bigger than that world that he created that he said, I want you to rule over this with me. He gave us a bigger gift than that. You know what he did? He made himself small. He made himself a speck of dust like us. That is unimaginable. I just, are you, look, I, this is one of those moments where I am desperately, and I've, I've prayed this morning, that some way you will feel what I felt this last week in writing this part right here, because this is an amazing paradox. This is something that will stick with me for the rest of my life, and I want it to stick with you. Don't miss this. In our sin, we tried so desperately to make ourselves as big as God. In my sin, I wanted to be God, and I tried so hard to make myself as big as God, and I failed miserably, and I earned death. And yet, in his love, he made himself as small as me. And he won me eternal life. I can't get over that. How do we not fall to our knees? Praise God. I just, I, I can't put words to it. And here's the thing I don't want you to miss. You don't have to wait for this. You don't have to wait until your dying day to encounter this. It starts right now. It was always intended to start right now. You don't have to, those of you who are older, you don't have to spend the next 10 or 20 years that you may have left. Or if you're younger, please, please don't start. Don't start for the next 50 or 60 years walking down this path. Get it right now. You don't have to try to be something. That isn't what's required of you to find significance. It's not going to work apart from him any better than it worked for anybody else. So stop the vain efforts because you are way too small. You and I are way too small to ever achieve significance on our own. Meaning and purpose 
God has such a better idea. Jesus said it this way, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come. I have made myself a speck of dust. For what purpose? So that they may have life and have it to the full. I am here to reconnect the branch that they cut off. In their stupidity, in their ignorance, in their rebellion, you cut yourself off from the source of life. You can't have life apart from it. So I am here to reconnect you to the source of life and you can have it to the full. Look at what the prophet Isaiah, it's the exact same thing. The prophet Isaiah says it, uh, chapter 57, verse 15. For this is what the high and mighty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. This is what God says. I live in a high and holy place, but I also live with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly, the sinful. To revive the heart of the repentant. He will reconnect you to the source of life in your repentance. Jesus has come to reconnect the branch for you. you listen, if you're fading, this is where I close. I'm, I'm done after this. Don't miss this. You don't have to worry about being too small or too ordinary or too tiny or too sinful to be loved. You do not have to worry about that. You don't have to use your dreams to try to make yourself big enough to be noticed by someone or by others. You don't have to achieve great things to be significant enough in this life. You don't have to somehow create your own meaning and your own purpose to life because you have it all in the unmerited, unearned love of your creator, your savior, your God, who you know what? He noticed you. And he loved you, and he chooses you just as you are. Praise God. Father, I thank you for that truth. I thank you for the meaning of life. It's nothing short of that. It's, it's like it's some great secret, and people spend their lives, and they write books and novels and volumes to try to find the secret of life, and it's right there. It's in connection to you. Forgive us for our vain efforts to try to achieve all of these great things when what you desperately desire is for us to recognize that our meaning and our significance and our worth and our purpose comes in connecting to the greatest love we could ever know. The love of you expressed through your son Jesus. And Father, my heart is burdened this morning because I know that there are people who are here or there are people who are watching this online who don't have that and who actually are going to spend the rest of today working on something because they're trying desperately to achieve significance when what you want them to do is lay it aside and talk to you, to commune with you, to, to relate to you, to make you laugh, to find their joy in you. Father, I pray for them. I pray that they maybe for the first time in their life, would feel the love of their Heavenly Father. Wherever we are, Father, you know, and I just pray that you would break down the barriers, the walls, the sin, the rebellion, whatever it is, and that you would help your precious creations, your sons and your daughters, find life in you. That'll separate us. That'll make us different, and that will draw all men to you, and that is our desire. And we pray it in the name above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. amen. If you have a decision to make, you want to come to the Father, do it. Don't wait. Do it right now as we stand and as we sing.